The idea of being European may call a distinct image to mind, but what does it really mean to be European? How did so many monarchs establish themselves in this part of the world, and where did the name Europe come from anyway? The ancient Greeks divided the known world into three parts – Europe, Asia, and Libya. This historical source leads some to believe that the name comes from the Greek Eurus, meaning wide, and ops, meaning face or eye. The reasoning behind this theory is that it describes the broad shoreline of Europe, as viewed by the Greeks, and denotes that the Greeks considered Europe to be the mainland. Others argue that the concept of Europe is much older and stems from ancient Mesopotamia. Subscribers to this theory reason that Europe comes from the Akkadian word Arabu, meaning sunset, and as the sun sets in the west, this was the name for the lands west of Mesopotamia. Similarly, there is the argument that this is how Asia got its name, as it lays east of Mesopotamia and the Akkadian word for sunrise is Asu. Yet another theory involves Europa, a goddess that dates back millennia and has many stories attributed to her. Despite all of these credible suggestions, the true origin of the name Europe and how long it has been in use can only be speculated. While modern humans began to inhabit Europe around 40 to 50,000 years ago, the history of Europe as we know it didn't really kick off until the Mycenaeans. The Greeks expanded and refined their culture until they were conquered by the Macedonians, who took Greek colonization to a whole new level. It wasn't long before another European power would take it upon themselves to spread Greek culture throughout the rest of Europe. The Romans came, saw, and conquered so much of Europe that pretty much every European monarch since has tried to replicate their success. The fall of Rome gave way to the Germanic people, who started to form kingdoms, and the Christian church began to gain power and influence. Although there were some brief periods where Europe was partially unified, fragmented political power resulted in the emergence of the feudal system. This system began when local landowners and lords, unchecked by a higher authority, expanded their territory and intensified control over the people living there. The concept of European royalty directly stemmed from the feudal system and gave birth to many powerful families that engaged in power grabs over the following centuries. As a result, Europe's past is littered with many brutal acts in the name of money and power. As it is impossible to recount the entire history of the multifaceted royal families in under 15 minutes, here are a few cherry-picked tales from the annals of European history. Aethelred the Unready was one of the first monarchs to be publicly embroiled in murderous plots. It didn't work out the best for him, as his moniker may denote. Unready comes from the Old English word unraid, meaning no counsel or bad counsel. This was a play on his name, which meant noble counsel. Aethelred came to power in 978 after the assassination of his half-brother. Rumor had it that Aethelred was involved in the murder, but as he was only around 10 years old at the time, this seems unlikely. Nevertheless, the suspicion stuck and created a distrust of his rule amongst the other English lords. Due to this disloyalty, England was not unified sufficiently to withstand a resurgence of Viking invasions in 980. Aethelred did no favors for himself or his subjects when he provoked more attacks by massacring Danish settlers in 1002. Despite his perceived failures and being deposed by the Danish king Swain I for one year, Aethelred was succeeded by his sons Edmund Ironside and later Edward the Confessor. Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart, may be one of the first romanticized English kings in Europe's history, mainly thanks to the tales of Robin Hood. However, in reality, he was an irresponsible monarch, focusing all his efforts and his country's money on his personal ambitions. Richard was born in England but, at the age of 11, was given the Duchy of Aquitaine. Although Richard gained fame for his knightly prowess, he was pretty reckless, a trait that seemed to run in the family. Richard and his brothers attempted an unsuccessful rebellion against their father, after which some of the brothers turned on each other, notably Richard and his older brother Henry. When Henry died unexpectedly in 1183, Richard found himself the heir to the thrones of England, Normandy, and Anjou. On receiving this legacy, Richard's father, Henry II, asked him to pass the Duchy of Aquitaine to his youngest brother, John. The latter would become King John, Robin Hood's infamous adversary. Determined to keep whatever power that came his way, 
Richard refused and appealed to King Philip II of France for help against his own father. In 1189, Richard openly joined with Philip and drove Henry II into submission, supported by his brother John. Suffering from defeat and a bleeding ulcer, Henry II died in July of the same year. On receiving the thrones, Richard's thoughts did not turn to providing for his subjects or ruling his newly acquired lands. Instead, he set his sights on leading a crusade to the Holy Land, prompted by the 1187 capture of Jerusalem by Saladin. Richard sold everything he could to fund his crusade, including royal treasure, sheriffdoms, and other offices. In 1190, he had amassed a formidable fleet and sailed for the Holy Land via Sicily. Before leaving, Richard made John swear that he would not enter England in Richard's absence. Before arriving at his destination, a series of events led to Richard naming his nephew, Arthur, Duke of Brittany, as his heir. This act enraged John, who immediately broke his oath and traveled to England, where he would unsuccessfully try and claim the throne while Richard was imprisoned in what is now Austria while on his way back from the Crusades. In the Holy Lands, Richard fought with his allies just as much as their enemy. He insulted the Austrian Duke, Leopold V, by tearing down his banner, and argued with French King Philip II, who returned to France prematurely. Richard also upset the Germans by supporting Guy de Lusignan as a candidate for the crown of Jerusalem in place of the German nominee. His actual fight with Saladin ended with a truce in 1192. Knowing he had not made any friends in Europe, Richard tried traveling back home in disguise. Nevertheless, he was discovered and imprisoned eventually negotiating his release for a hefty ransom, paid for out of the prosperous pockets of England. Despite his reckless rule, Richard Lionheart was beloved in his time, but his legacy as the benevolent king who pardons Robin Hood seems a little far-fetched in light of his other actions. But stranger things have happened. Charles II of Navarre was so treacherous that he received the nickname Charles the Bad. Navarre is a region in northern Spain, and Charles was determined to expand his territory and power. Charles ruled from 1349 to 1387 and conspired with pretty much everyone. He plotted with the English against John II of France, who had given lands once owned by Charles's mother to the Constable of France, the latter of whom Charles had murdered by his supporters in 1354. As he continued conspiring with the English, John arrested Charles in 1356. Charles escaped and continued his dodgy dealings with every powerful party in France, eventually winning back Normandy. He replicated his fickle allegiance in Spain, where he first supported Peter the Cruel of Castile against Peter IV of Aragon in 1362. Then a year later, he did a 180 and switched Peters. After John of France died, the new king, Charles V, through military actions, forced Charles of Navarre to renounce most of his major claims in France. In 1378, Navarre lost Normandy once more when it was proven that not only was Charles planning to renew his alliance with England, but he was also plotting to poison Charles V. Hot on the heels of Charles of Navarre was Charles V's son, also called Charles. Perhaps the most frustrating thing about the European monarchs was their limited imagination when it came to naming babies. The French king Charles VI began his reign as Charles the Beloved, but ended it as Charles the Mad. His reign of 42 years was relatively long, but he spent most of it as a figurehead rather than an active monarch. Ascending to the throne at the age of 11, he ruled under the tutelage of his uncles until he was 19. Four years later, he became ill with convulsions and a fever, and from there on, he would have regular bouts of madness lasting from three to nine months. At one point, he was so convinced he was made of glass that he had tailors sew rods into his clothes to keep him from shattering. His death left France divided between English-controlled regions in the north and those in the south loyal to the French Dauphin, Charles. European history is littered with stories of unsuitable and unstable royalty, and many were a product of severe inbreeding. Strategic marriages throughout the Middle Ages meant that by the Renaissance, most royals in Europe were related in some way or another. Royal betrothals often involved marrying a distant relation, but the Habsburgs took this to extreme. The Habsburgs were so intent on keeping power in the family that Carlos II of Spain was the product of 16 generations of inbreeding, so much so that his grandmother was also his aunt. Carlos was the last male in the line of Spanish Habsburgs. 
He possessed a massively pronounced Habsburg jaw, meaning that he could not chew his food, and his tongue was so large he could barely speak. Carlos also suffered from many other ailments, including intellectual disabilities, skeletal deformity, epilepsy, and infertility. Carlos, also known as Charles, became king at the age of four, with his mother ruling in his stead until he was 14. No one bothered to educate Carlos, and he was not allowed to walk until he was around 10, as his legs could hardly support his weight. Illiterate and incapable, Carlos was entirely dependent on his courtiers. He died at the age of 38 without producing an heir, despite the best efforts of his family, who somehow managed to secure him two brides, which set the War of the Spanish Succession in motion. Some of Europe's later monarchs were no better than the earlier ones. They just had more scope for their machinations due to newly discovered lands. Leopold II, King of the Belgians from 1865 to 1909, is best known for the many atrocities that were carried out in the Congo Free State under his rule. Leopold was the first of the European leaders to develop the Congo River Basin. He formed the Congo Free State in 1885, where the colonial invaders committed many acts of barbaric cruelty. Rather than establish a colony, Leopold declared private ownership of the region. Under the guise of bringing civilization to the Congo, Leopold brutally exploited the people, forcing them into labor and using the region's resources, including ivory and rubber, for his own personal enrichment. It is estimated that half of the region's indigenous people died from malnutrition, European disease, or punishment, and many were tortured. A common form of punishment was amputating hands or feet. When these conditions were uncovered in 1905, it led to an international scandal that saw the region removed from Leopold's control. Of course, this was by no means the only case of atrocities carried out by Europeans throughout the world, although perhaps it was among the most brazen. Europe's history is as complex and convoluted as the Game of Thrones books, which used the royals of medieval Europe as its inspiration. Today, European culture is as diverse as it ever was, from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean. Portugal to Ukraine. But whatever the differences in traditions or climate, being European means belonging to a rich, if somewhat checkered, history. To learn more about the history of Europe, check out our book, European History, a captivating guide to the history of Europe, starting from the Neanderthals through to the Roman Empire and the end of the Cold War. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.